Good. Hello, everybody. My name is Eva Bradley. I am the co-founder and CEO of Art Cube Nation, and I truly, truly appreciate all of you joining us today for yet another Zoom call. Um, we, today, we're going to talk about clearances, product placement, great and intellectual property. Truly one of the most confusing and murky chores in the art department, but also really important because after all, protecting the rights of artists is really important. And historically that is more important than ever. But like art and design principles, there are rules and there are exceptions to the rules and it all seems up to be up for interpretation. So real quick, if you are not an Cube Nation member, I'd like to welcome you and let you know that we consider it our job to provide these sort of, not only a moderated platform like artcubenation.com for professional communications to offer jobs and ask for peer advice or post set sales, but a trusted resource and a community with a culture of helping our peers. If you are a member, we thank you for being a part of this. It's an honor to serve you, uh, Jess, Liz, and myself. Um, we consider it's a job that we take very seriously, um, in particular to labor and rate standards, long-standing non-discriminatory uh, policies, animal rights, which comes up way too often, and peer-to-peer -peer production asset swapping, which is budget-friendly, but it's also earth-friendly too. And so we take sort of a holistic view to what our purpose is. Um, and if you have yet to join, we hope you do. We will think you find that Art Cube is more than a group, but a support system with a lot to offer your professional and personal life, because frankly, in the art department, what's the difference? Um, so for a little housekeeping, um, all the um, attendees, please put yourself on mute and panelists if you'd please silence your phones. Um, Jess Costa, C-O-S-T-A, she's Art Cube Nation's community manager. She's our co-host and will be fielding your questions, which we'll get to at the end with any luck. Um, so you can direct your questions directly to her and she'll ask. Um, but we're also going to follow up with an email and a blog post. So no need to take notes. We'll do that for you. We'll put this out on the web. We're scheduled until 12, but I'm happy to stay on as long as our panelists can stay. They're very busy people and as, and as guests, or we can just chit chat and have some fun. Um, I'm going to introduce um, our panelists, give you a quick read of their bios, and then we're going to hop right into it because there's so many questions. Uh, our first panelist is going to be Stephanie Ferging Adwar. She's a founding partner of Ferging and Adwar LLP. She brings 30 years of experience in transactional and litigation matters of entertainment, copyright, trademark, technology, unfair competition laws. She represents a wide variety of clients in entertainment field, including independent film productions, screenwriters, producers, actors, comedians, authors, goes on, and, um, and in television companies, as well as obtaining, maintaining, and protecting firms, clients as complex intellectual property rights from licensing and other transactions through litigation. We also have Don Cullen Jonas, uh, fascinating bio, originally from Virginia, Don Cullen Jonas played division one college basketball at Old Dominion University. And she came to the indie world originally as an investor, but wanting to learn more about production, she volunteered as an office intern and was tasked with clearances. Now she's here today, this is her profession, the rest is history. <laughs> We also have the fabulous Beth Bell, founder of Green Product Placement. She's an entrepreneur, a business consultant, and a longtime IOTC studio mechanic with a career in film and television production that spans decades. As a Green Product Placement founder, Beth was inspired with the prospect of being able to use a very powerful and engaging marketing platform to promote products in line with her and our personal purchasing ethics and ethics have a very large and growing group of savvy consumers, whilst at the same time making it easier for filmmakers, production designers, set decorators, costume designers, and prop people to find geographically correct, socially conscious, and green products for use in their film and television. And last but not least, an industry favorite pillar in the community, Joel Barkow, founder of Barcode Props. Joel has spent 30 plus, how many pluses, Joel? Uh, <laughs> in the film and TV industry in New York City, he worked as a prop master, local 52 prop master on set dresser on dozens of film and television shows. Joel, we worked on a movie that nobody saw a long time ago, and he, he, he has leveraged his deep knowledge of the industry 
into the creation of a prop rental house that serves all prop needs from low budget to major movies. He's the father of five boys, all of whom can actually explain what he does for a living. Hats off to that. I'm still trying to explain what I do to people. So Stephanie, let's start with you. 15 okay. years ago, when I was not drop coordinator, clearances were scary. Everyone is terrified of getting sued. There are fabled tales of litigation that keep producers up at night. The clearance mandates and requirements from corporate change seem to change from job to job. So it, at least in my experience, copyright laws seem nebulous. So everyone erred on the side of paranoid. By judging uh, and judging by the enormous amount of questions that we got from Art Cube members, these questions still persist. So I'm going to start with some questions that Art Cubers sent in. Okay, so uh, one Cuber wrote in uh, regarding government agencies. I've heard conflicting views about government agencies. Are items found on .gov websites fair use, and fair use comes up a lot, because they are owned by taxpayers, FBI, CIA logos in particular. Okay, so that's a fairly complicated question. So, or fairly piece, there are pieces there. So let's start with the first thing. Okay. Okay, the first thing is that um, anything, any works that are created by the government, uh, textual works, anything they write, any um, art they create, is in the public domain. It is the product of, tax, of taxpayer ownership. What is not in the public domain are logos and uh, seals and those types of items. If you want permission to use FBI on, on something, you're gonna have to get permission to use it. Um, they don't like, there is, there are, it's not that the rules are nebulous, but there is a rule I actually, um, that you can't use the seals without permission at, and you can't use them in a way that implies endorsement. So the question is, it does you know, law, and, law and order have the right to use FBI on, you know, when they're telling the story about the FBI coming in? And the question, the, the, the answer is not likely unless they have permission, although it could very well be argued that there would be, nobody would imply permission of the FBI in a fictional narrative program. The okay. laws, copyright law is not particularly nebulous. What it is, is a definitive about who owns what work, right? So when you create a work of authorship, right? When you write some and, and you fix it in a tan, what's called a tangible medium of expression. So when you take this idea that you have in your head and you fix it on in, on paper, on film, on uh, in sculpture, in painting, in photographs, whatever medium you choose to fix it in, you then have a copyright by virtue of the Berne Convention, whether you have a registration for that copyright or not. So you have created an, a, a work of authorship by by creating that um, that copyright. When we talk about fair use of other people's copyrights. We're talking, what fair use is, is a, an absolute defense to infringement. It is not a per, permissive rule. It is, if, if you act within fair use standards, you are not infringing. And obviously there are cases, in fact, there was just a very recent case decided, which was the Warhol case, which just came down, which we could get into in a, a whole discussion about fair use and transformative works on, on what they allowed, but it's finally the right decision as far as I'm concerned. Um, but there, it, fair use is, it, is the exception. The question, people throw fair use out as if, well, is this, isn't this fair use? And the question, and sometimes that's not the question. The question should be, is, is the work that I'm using in the public domain? Um, is the work that I'm using owned by somebody else? Is my use of someone else's work permissible? Um, so I, I'm happy to go into the fair use stuff if you if you want a quick well, analysis. I, I think that's a good overview, but I do want to know, is there a resource where we where from your computer that you can search something to see if it is fair use or if it is public domain? Like, is there a database somewhere? No. No. Okay. So, no, there's just not um, because there's a billion works, right? Every. Right. Um, so, public domain anything pre I think it's now 1924 
any work created before 1924 is in the public domain by just virtue of time. So if you pick up a, a recording of, um, say some, uh, I think Rudolph is one of those songs. Um, if it's a recording from 1923, you can use it. If it's a recording from 1953, you can't use the recording, but you could use the underlying public domain composition. So you have to know, and look, lawyers are your best friends when you're making a film. Yes. And, and I know everyone wants to not go to them because they're costly and it adds to the cost of the, the production. And I totally get that, but it's way more expensive way more costly if you make a mistake that could have cost you a few hundred dollars to answer the to, to get an answer to rather than a couple hundred thousand dollars in litigation so it's always better to get advice right always better to find out so there's no there is copyright.gov which is the copyright office website the library of congress website you can file there for copyrights if you create something that what you want protection for and you can go to it and do a search if you are looking for particular things that you think might be copy, copyrighted and you want to get permission to use them, you can go on copyright.gov, do a search by title, by name of author, last name first, by um, uh, title of the work. You can put all of that in and ask for that to see if it exists. Now, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's a place to start. It's a but good it's a place, place to, to start. start because gotcha. if you find out what you will find is who is the copyright claimant and who you can contact. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. If it's so depending upon the work, that's a good place to start. If it's music, there is a place to go. There are a couple of places to go to see if you can get that, th those works. And that's, you could go to ASCAP.com or BMI.com and, and search their registers and see if there are songs there and that's gotcha. that, that gotcha. you can put in. And I've, and I've got, that's great. And I have a real quickie question for you. Um, it's about a poor man's copyright. We got a question from a cuber. Does sending a script to yourself in the mail, dated and sealed, never opening it, constitute a shoestring copyright? No, there's no, no that's a good answer. Okay, really uh, good. Listen, I, I, I'll just really quickly so you understand why this is no, because I literally had a professor at, at NYU tell us that we could do that. And I went to NYU film undergrad oh. and, and she told us that, and I was the daughter of a copyright lawyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and actually the course I was taking, I was taking while I was in law school because I wanted to update my producing information. Um, anyway, why is it not one? While you have a copyright in the work that you have created upon its fixation, you do not have access to the courts of the state of the United States without a registration certificate. That is, and that is new agreed upon Supreme Court law. You must have the registration in order to go into court. That's your ticket of admission. What, what does that mean? It means when you complete a work, it is in your best interest to register that work with the US Copyright Office within three months of its completion, of its, when you finish the work and three, preferably either prior to publication or within three months of publication. And the reason for that is because you have a window of time to register it in which if somebody infringes it, you can still look back. After three months, if you register it outside of that three month window and somebody infringes before you register, you will not be able to avail yourself of particular remedies in court like statutory damages which and possibly attorney's fees, which is really important because most times copyright infringement cases are not big money earners. They're not, you know, the, the penalty, what you really want is to stop people from infringing, not necessarily make a ton of money on it. So you want your attorney's fees covered and you want your, uh, you want to be able to get at least statutory damages, which range in a willful case from 30,000 to $150,000 per infringement. So you want to register your, your, okay. your, your work so that you have that right. If you don't, the, the, um, what you have to know about not um, about protection of your works is and and why you want to make sure it's registered is because even though you have that copyright, you cannot get into court and it's a it's a bludgeon to hit over the head of people that you want to stop from stealing your stuff. Got it. Thank you. So and I, you know what you you talked me into it. Yes, a lawyer is your best friend on a film. They need to call you, but I also think that need to call perhaps an expert in the field of clearances like our next speaker 
Um, Dawn, a clearance coordinator. Um, Dawn, you volunteered as a production office intern and was, were tasked with the clearances. This is part of what I find so confusing about clearances. If it's such a uh, it's been such a threat. Why would an intern of untested competen competencies get the responsibility? That's a, that's not necessarily a question, but it's like it's something that's looming over my head. But so so Dawn, uh, we had a question in from a Cuber about period films. Uh, in your experience, is it safer to use things? And this is another fair use. Is it safer to use things as fair? Is it as fair use to create a realistic version of a time period? Uh, no, and any doesn't matter what the period is, the artwork needs to be cleared. Um, if, if, now, if you were going to, if it, I'm working on a, on a show now that's set in 1991, so that they're in bodegas and things like that, so they have to have Ritz crackers or Twinkies or whatever the packaging is. And uh, one thing is, is I, um, Stephanie, you, you sound like my kind of lawyer. I like it. <laughs> um, every production is different. So it's going to depend upon the production what they what they'll allow on this production we're allowing them if they can find the period packaging and recreate it um uh you know like images of it and recreate it uh authentically they can use it without permission but it it doesn't matter what period it is as you said i think i think it's actually 1925 is what what is it before 1925 is is uh is public domain so even that you know just Everything needs to be cleared. It's basically gotcha. The, okay, so period doesn't really matter. I know these are one-on-one -on -one questions, but they're they're just nebulous. So, what about companies? This is another question that came in. What about companies that are defunct or out of business? If they existed in the fifties but not today, and you can't find the copyright owner, what's the risk? Well, you you just have to do research because there's you can usually find a paper trail. A company, unless it's like some mom and pop on the corner printing shop or something like that, somebody usually buys, if they have something that was copyright, somebody usually buys it up. If you think about all the, uh, and this, this for, for me, it would be like record, uh, record uh, album covers, but how many old record companies there used to be uh, mm -hmm. and they've all been bought up. So just because Atlantic Records doesn't exist anymore, um, that doesn't mean that somebody didn't buy their, uh, what, they do uh, still exist, by the way. <laughs> what? Atlantic still exists. Oh, geez. I'm sorry. <laughs> Polydor one? doesn't, though. You can yeah. use that. <laughs> Polydor yeah. doesn't. So there's there's a bunch that don't. I don't. I, there, you are right. <laughs> uh, can I just? I just want to interrupt John for one second, because you're we're talking about copyright, but John, you, I, we've talked before about trademark before we got on this call. That's a big part of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, you to sort of go on that trend because it's not just the copyright that right. you have an issue with, right? Right. So when it, the, so the packaging, the packaging that I was just talking about, those would be those would be trademark uh, trademark issues, not copyright so much. So it is, yeah, I deal with both trademark and and copyright, but it's also going to depend on the production, what the production allows. I have one studio that has no problem with us using real. Um, logos, real, uh, you know, NYPD, FBI, all of those seals, they don't care. But another show, this period show I'm talking about, they said, no, you have to make, you have to make up your own NYPD um, shield um, and patches and things like that. So it's, 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 it is nebulous in the fact that it's, every production is different. So everybody has different levels of risk tolerance, I think is the best and that, way. Is that what it comes down to risk tolerance, just not uh, not knowing the law or not or misinterpreting it, it's just risk tolerance? Well, it, it, for me, it, it's gonna come down to, if I'm working with with Stephanie, the one, in, I think you, another question you asked me is what the first thing I do. The first thing I do if, if I start a new job is, is ask who, who my legal contact is, who, what law firm am I working with? And, and then I will send them a list of, of kind of basic questions. How do you feel about these things? And see what they come back with. And then that gives me an idea of what, uh, you know, what, what I'm going to be allowed to do. <laughs> what the thresholds are for the, like, so, so it doesn't get thrown back to you. I think that's really smart. It's just like, if, listen, if it's, you know, if it, if it varies, here are the variables, tell me what my parameters are. I think that's a great idea. Okay, so another Cuber said the clearance coordinator pulled some vintage bookends from a bookshelf that was in the background. 
They were chrome, the shape of airplanes, no stickers or markings. What's the reasoning behind so I can prepare for future projects, not do that again? It's going to depend on if, if how decorative it is. I mean, people say, oh, but this is mass produced. It, it doesn't, you know, it, it, if it's mass produced, there's no copyright and that's not true. Depends on how decorative and how, and how, um, you know, distinctive they are more than, more than anything. So. You know, when I, when I read that question, I was like, I think I've seen those. So maybe it's a high designer or something like that too. And do you, do you use online resources or any databases to, to research things? All different. I, I mean, yeah. Gazillions. Yeah. I mean, the first thing you do with something like that, if I was to get up, you know, those, those book bookends is the reverse Google image search is your best friend. Um, ah. so see if it pops up that way. And then, then you just Google it, you know, you're trying, you, you, it's re researching is the most important thing in this job. And because I, my, I hate saying no, I, I want to work with the art departments. I want to say yes to everything. I want you to have everything that you want. Um, so I have to figure out ways to find the information, but I can't just do it because I, I like it. I have to have something to back it up. And sometimes you can't get a definitive answer. And sometimes I gather all the information I have and I can't find a definitive, but I think that this might be okay. I might've run it down that there's no estate, there's no heir to this specific artist estate. And, uh, and I take it all to the production attorney and ask them to review it. And you know they'll either give it, because it's not for me to decide that if I can't come up with a specific um, yes or no. And, uh, and I have one little quick question we'll move on to product placement. Um, so do you have a story we all have nightmare stories in our in our in our you know war book uh can you tell us a story about like the most challenging clearance like what hoops you have to jump through is there something that was in particularly difficult or is there something that's a particular like tattoos or graffiti or is there anything is there an area that's like just a nightmare oh wow um a difficult uh, a difficult one I, there there have been lots of difficult ones but uh one difficult, has anybody anybody been to Mineta Tavern in New York City? Yeah. Um, and there's like a billion things on the wall. Uh, there's all kinds of caricatures. I mean, the walls are just absolutely filled. And uh, my understanding is no one's been able to ever film there without covering everything up because they couldn't clear it. And it took me about three weeks, but I cleared all the, and finding the, you know, finding the, 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 the tracking down the, um, the, um, the heirs to the, to the the artists that did the caricatures. And uh, my my assistant is a has a background in genealogy and really uh, you know uh, really, really great. Um, she, un she understands how to follow those threads. And uh, we use ancestry.com, you know, to find and and to find obituaries, to find next of kin and that type of thing. Um, the hardest one I think I had though, was this was a scripted element in a in a uh, a show and it was a some sort of card game sort of i can't remember the name but it's sort of like dungeons and dragons so the cards were really large and had artwork on them and it was scripted it was out in the hamptons on location 100 background actors and the characters were playing this game so there was no backup for it and it turned out that there were three different companies that owned the rights they all owned the rights and it came down to the morning that they were filming that I got the final. I, I didn't sleep that that I, week. I every yeah, I, I can only imagine that you do with that. That happens all the time. You get the finally get the facts in. You but know. there's no backup. That's what gets me about production is they have they ask for something and they want, you know, and you try to get it for them, but they don't have what if I couldn't have gotten that? You know, they would have there would have been a big hole in the script. And, that, yeah. I, and now it makes me think that we need to connect like clearances with location managers because it'd be like, hey, listen, if you want three weeks of clearances, go to Manetta's. You know what I mean? Because they, there's a whole bunch of like, do they need do they need a little bit of education of like, be really careful because of those sort of things. I think that's interesting. Well, I think everybody's very well aware. They'll go on director scouts and I'll be getting text messages like say, hey, what do you think about this? They 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 know. Everybody yeah. is aware of 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So uh, I do want to pop over. We're going to come back to everyone at the, at the end, but let's pop over to Joel Barco. So what you options are to get Greek props, right? Joel, you were a 52 prop master for years, and now you're on a wonderful rental company, Barcode Props, that rents Greek and Indie, that's non descript if you guys don't know, products to the entertainment industry. So we got some Cuber questions in, and I found this one really interesting about automotive greeking. What should and should not be greeked? So one Cuber saw that, <coughs> excuse me, the letters were left alone, but they greeked the logo so they could read Land Rover, but the uh, but the logo was was greeked. What's up with that? Well, um, <laughs> my first question, I may even defer it <laughs> because of <laughs> right out of the box, Eva. Um, um, you know, because what I've always understood when I was on set is that if it's if you get a verbal, if like you can verbally say it, then you can show it. Is that right? Um, but if you don't have that, you have to Greek the logo. I may have that backwards. But, um, you know, I don't have any Lamborghinis or Mercedes in my shop to, to Greek and send out. Well, so. but you were, you were on set for a while and this was about, yeah. so I thought, you know, and if it is notice, then we need to call up Stephanie and see what the new laws are and, and see and help define that because that was a, confu that was a, a confusing thing to this Cuber. Like, why can I read Land Rover? Is that a law? And but then the logo is Greeked out. Maybe that's a trademark. Anyway, let's come back to Stephanie on that one, maybe in a little bit. But um, so, and I think someone talked about purchasing. Uh, like if you purchase a prop, that does not lead to clearance whatsoever, not even close. And so, uh, and this was a lot of questions came in about this, about whose job is it to Greek? In Local 52, who does the Greeking? There have been accounts of it lives, so, it lives somewhere between set dressing props and scenic. So where, who, who does it belong to? Whose job is it to Greek? Well, it's a total total crossover. I mean, at barcode props, I well, when I was on set, if it was a prop and I was in the prop department because I worked different departments, it was it was our responsibility. Um, if it was it was something that was built and uh, or, or or modified, you know, it would kind of be a group effort between scenic set dressing uh, prop. We all heads had had to talk to each other from the barcode props perspective. I uh, like to send everything out as Greek as possible. Um, and, and, and in the most proper way that I used to, that I learned on set to do, not just like a piece of red tape on, <laughs> on something, you know, and, and say, here, it's Greek, but to really, you know, take the time because um, the whole idea of barcode was founded on was ease of use. So if you, when I was on set, like one thing that bothered me always was like logos from companies like mine that were that were all over the item make sure barcode we we barely mark it you know just so you don't have to deal with that on set that's not Gre greeking but it's just ease of use um also to if, if it's a stereo system you know kenwood needs to be out let's say we greek that out nicely you receive it on set okay there's it yes we all, may all know it's a kenwood but it doesn't glaringly say this, this, you know. And I think that's a benefit of renting from barcode props is your experience and your and knowledge that you'll send it out. So you're really saving them time and money uh, with, you know, with your rentals because you do it the right way with your given experience and, and go, um, money. I know that you also rent fake money and sometimes buckets of it, lots of drug dealers in your game, right? So. So one Cuber said uh, they've had producers insisting on fake money and then other producers insisting on real money. Can you provide some clarity? What do we do? Um, I always say go with the fake money um, whenever you can. Um, you know, I guess in the past, it was always a thing. The original when I, when I was propping was don't use the real money because serial numbers can be traced, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, uh, and you, you don't want to have that traceability. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. I uh, then 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 when prop money started coming into a fold into the fold, it was all very sketchy for a while because the more real it looked, you wanted to stay away from that because that would be a, a, 
uh, dangerous to use. So um, the money today that I that I use um, clearly states on it uh, for motion picture use only, but not in a glaring way. It, the money looks really good, but the uh, you know it it states it there, so there's no question mark about it. You so know. it's in fine print, and it's just I mean you wouldn't see it yeah. unless you did a zoom, and they probably shouldn't be zooming there anyway. Like that's the DB's problem at that point, right? Right. Um, and then so and you talked about the the piece of tape. So there's a really wonderful Instagram feed called Bad Greeking. I think everyone should go there. It's hilarious. <laughs> so and that, and so Bad Greeking exists. And it, 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 you know, it's fortuitous. And so now it's um it's ubiquitous. Um so how but just to, to give us a little like how does greeking a Coke can with a piece of red tape over the sea? Does that actually protect the brand and the filmmaker? I mean, the better way is to rent it or to or to get your ND stuff. But like, should we be doing that? The, to have a can of oak? <laughs> yeah, I I I don't think so. <laughs> I I in at all times I would I would go with a fake label. I would I would go I would well. Another thing that I did a lot when when promo, promotions were starting out were really big, and I was working on Spin City at the time, and uh, like uh, Fiji Fiji Water was coming to me and said, "You've got to get Fiji Water," and the producers like, "We need all the Fiji Water we can get on the set because you know and then we have free water," and Fiji wanted me to put it in in the hands. It was network television though, so the way I always did it was I would get into their hands, but but they couldn't show that label. The actor would work with me. If you see the, if you could see the uh, shape of the bottle, to me that was okay, but, and, yeah. and the companies seemed to think it was okay because they gave us a lot of Fiji water. Um, <laughs> so, but I wouldn't. I I stay away from the the that kind of greeking. I I just don't think it's. It doesn't look good, you know. It, it doesn't. It does, and it, and I can see how that would bother you too because the aesthetics do come into it, and you know, and all of that. So. Uh, before we move on to product placement, um, what kind, like, what kind of pr do you offer? These products do you offer, and what are the most popular items that go out from Barcrest? So, just give us a, like an example of all the pre-Greek items they can get from Barcode Props, and not have to deal with any of this mess. What right. Well, a lot of well, you talked about the money, so that that's a big thing in Barcode. But um, some of the other things that the the ones I get are. Um, for bar scenes, uh, liquor bottles. Mm. You know, I make sure that our, you know, we, we have graphics on there that are are cleared, pre-cleared, and then and then um, then we'll we'll sign the documentation that says, you know, uh, for for the productions that it's it's cleared and ready to go. Um, mic cubes or mic flags on press mics uh, mm. that have logos, uh, you know, station identification numbers and all that. That's all pre-cleared. Uh, magazines are a big one. I have like a, a, a set dress piece that's a newsstand. Um, I don't, <laughs> and, and on my end, I stay away from the product of the newsstand. I just give them the shell and I let the others deal with that. But um, as far, but we just had one where they needed a ton of magazines and we have those, um, you know, uh, all pre pre-cleared. Um, those are some of the major and, and do you And do they give you the paperwork to sign or do you have paperwork that accompanies the products that you rent? It's all, it's all uh, like a blanket, all within my equipment lease agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. But it's there for Stephanie and others to tweak and, and <laughs> make real. <laughs> make I, I think all the panelists need to like have their own powwow and, and you know, and I, you know, and I would love to have to provide to, an, an, you know, a first time indie uh, production, you know, just getting their start up and coming directors, a, a very basic uh, clearance form. I mean, you know, when I was an art department coordinator, I had mine that I took from a job that somebody sent me from a job. And so, you know, and having that language might be something that we would want to provide to art group or something very basic that should be looked at, but at least something to go by. So thank you, Joel, we'll get back to you. Um, products, we've been talking a lot about products. Um, and next is Beth Bell, uh, because the other course is to actually use their real products with their permission. Uh, and there are all kinds of companies that represent brands because they opt to have their products marketed in features and television to expand their market. So our next guest 
Beth Bell um, took the model a bit further to elevate brands that have sustainability baked in. Beth, hello, how are you? Hello, I'm okay, how are you? Hi, I'm great, thank you. So share with us your uh, green product placement founder story. Like what gave you the idea? Okay, so, um, you know, it's kind of a fun story. Uh, I, you know, I've been working as a union, you know, art department person since, you know, 1990. Um, and then I, I left and I worked for an experiential marketing company and was a manager there. Uh, and then they were, um, and, you know, we did brand and entertainment stuff and everything else. And, and, but it was kind of a related field, not really film and television. And, uh, and then in spring of 2011, uh, Morgan Spurlock was promoting his product placement documentary, uh, Palm Wonderful Presents the Greatest movie ever sold or whatever. And, and uh, I had seen the trailer and I thought it was hilarious. And I obviously I've seen the film and it, you know, it rings about 65% true. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's because it's just because it's Morgan. It's not really how real life necessarily works. Um, because, you know, his, that documentary was under the premise that like all product placement is this paid integration. And it's not actually the most common form of placement is trade out placement, which I'll explain in a moment. Okay. Um, but anyway, so, so here it was 2011, he posted, I'm going to be over on, it was a Saturday morning. I was like sitting at this very spot, the dining room table. He said, I'm going to be over on Ted.com answering questions about my new documentary, you know? And so I go on over and, and I thought back to 1998, I was the assistant set decorator on Runaway Bride and we had to do the curl up and die salon. And, and my boss, the set decorator was like, you know, to me and our PA of like, I hate all that stinky chemical crap you get from the product placement agencies, you know, hey, Beth and Jen, you know, see if you can bring in some natural brands. So, you know, we did some brand outreach um, uh, on our own uh, to, it was like, I think it was like a vein and kiss my face or something. Cause there, there, obviously there weren't as many brands as there are now that are, you know, more natural brands. So I remembered that and that at, even in 98, there was some production uh, need for that and production request and interest. And um, so I was like, clackety clack, you know, surely by now and doing your research, there's some agency that's, you know, mission-based only representing like better brands. And there was some back and forth and he's like, I think you found your next career, you know, smiley face. And I, I did an extensive search and I really didn't find, you know, what I knew to be like an Irma agency, Irma being the Entertainment Resources Marketing Association, which is the Association of Product Placement Professionals of which um, like maybe, you know, 85% of the big ag agencies belong to. There are some that, that don't, um, but uh, you know, and so, I, I, I couldn't find any that were specifically, you know, product placement agency, which with easily accessible client list for productions that was a member Irma that was mission based. And so I started one. So since then, you know, we placed over, you know, 150 plus brands and over 475 productions in the US, Canada, and the UK. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's always a win. But I mean, I, I am, I am not I am in the full understanding that I want a production to use as many product placement agencies and direct brand contacts as they absolutely need to dress prop and costume their show. I just, you know, I want GPP to be part of the equation. And also, you know, sometimes they will come to me, you know, like if they have to dress a, a whole foods type store, something like that. And obviously, I mean, I can't, you know, my brands can't provide enough product alone, but I, because I, I am keenly aware of the other, my competing agencies and which one of those actually represent a few natural brands, you know, I'm like, oh, oh, you want that? You know, this agency has this stuff or this agency I know has this stuff um, because I'm, I'm always out to encourage the use of better brands, even if, you know, they're not necessarily all from my agency. But and, yeah. and, and I think that's a great way to do business. Like you can, you can collaborate and show good faith because you want, you know, you, you, you retain your client, you make a friend on the other side who might throw it back to you. And, but when it comes exactly. back because your core values are being expressed in this mm -hmm. way. So with the brands that you do use, there's a thing called intended use that I have heard a lot. So what is, regarding your brands and intended use, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, 
I mean, how do you mean like uh Okay, well, uh, what I know is intended use is like if you're using a cleaning product, it's 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 to be used to clean. But if correct. I want to drink it because I'm a desperate alcoholic and I fall on the floor, like that's not that's how I always understood it. Too. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. so basically there's always the language, you know, that's built in to our agreement that that the product should be shown um, you know, in a positive or neutral light. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And okay, that, yeah. and that, and so, I mean, obviously, yeah, you're not going to have, you know, not going to have, you're not going to want to have, you know, again, an alcoholic, you know, drinking your product and then crashing a plane or using your cleaning product to, yeah. I mean, you just, we wouldn't allow that. I mean, we just plainly wouldn't allow that. So, you know, initially when the, when the uh, production or the studio, you know, gets a hold of us, I mean, I'd say, you know, maybe, maybe between 50 and 60% of the time, or maybe not even that much, maybe 40 to 50%, I can reveal a script, but at the very least they can, if there's a hand on props use, I will usually ask for pages. Um, and so, you know, sign an NDA, review the pages of how something is going to be used. Um, Cause yeah, obviously let's say if it's a snack bar, but the, but it's a hands-on prop and the dialogue says, oh, this tastes like cardboard. Well, yeah, of course we'll never approve that. We'll never approve that. So, you know, that's when you're better off going to your art department to come up with your fake name of your sawdust tasting snack bar or just <laughs> not, not showing a brand at all or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, yes, yes. If you're, if you're, you know, these brands, whether they're paying an integration fee or not, are doing productions a huge favor by providing all of this free cleared product. Right. And, um, you know, just as brands exist in in real life i mean look go and look around your own kitchen or go into any bodega i mean they, they exist in real life so if we're going to reflect real life in in uh content you know we're, we we want to show them in a realistic way and uh and so that also includes like not you know not using a use that is incorrect for the product gotcha and that makes it be a realistic use you're, of the you're, product you're yeah promoting their brand it's not yeah all that so it does i just want to get this, these phrases understood you know because if it, it confuses me and i've been in the, i've been in the business since 1992 uh then yep. it confuse someone who's who's five six you know up to 10 years in the business confusing um right well, thank you and now i kind of want to open up like i have a bunch of questions that have come in from panelists, I'm kind of going to open up the panel to what if anyone can pipe in here. So Maria says, I'm currently dealing with clearing some Mayan spellings for a fiction production. The Mexican copyright law is very new and complicated. And although the spellings are the are in the public domain, we have to ask permission to the Mayan community to show original hieroglyphs so they can make sure we're not damaging any moral rights. Can Stephanie, okay, this is for Stephanie, can, can can you speak to moral rights and how does it work in the clearance world? Or does anybody know anything about moral rights? All right, moral rights are the rights held by an author and they're not, we don't have them in the US. These okay. are foreign, these are foreign. And foreign countries do identify moral rights, which are the the, auth, the author's intent. So I, I, I'm not familiar with the Mexican copyright law. I, I would be, you know, I, 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 one of my best friends is, um, she, she worked for the Mexican Copyright Office, but you can get that answer by calling the Mexican Copyright Office. You know, there are, information is available. You can avail yourself of it. The Google is an amazing thing. If you can get to the .gov sites or .org sites, you're more likely to find trustworthy information than some YouTube video that somebody put up. Okay, right. so um, as far as being able to, I, I would imagine that the Mayan, that that is a, probably a cultural um, designation and that they are limiting it because of that. And that if that is the case and the government has set up a, a cultural designation for the, those works, you're going to have to go through the government to get that or, or go through the Mayan uh, entities specifically to get that permission. But I would absolutely talk to the Mexican Copyright Office. I would imagine they have the same things that we have here, which is a line that you can call and say, and by the way, if you can't and you need to talk to somebody who knows that, email me. I'm sure if you'll put up my email yeah. stuff, I can direct you to, a, I, I know the firm, former registrar of the Mexican Copyright Office, so I can get you to somebody there who can help. That's yet, yet another reason to have 
a, a, an attorney who knows some of this stuff, right? Because it's the access to the information that, that when you look at it and go, how could I possibly know this? There are people who absolutely knows, know this stuff. Well, th thank you for offering that. I do afraid of your inbox filling. So you let it, you let us know, um, but you're a great contact for us. And, you know, we will be I'm coming happy. in and hopefully, you know, um, uh, so there are a lot of like art, transformative art. People hear like over 30% is different. What constitutes transformative? So does anyone on the panel can really speak to if we take a, a piece of work and we rip it up and put it back together again, what's the deal? Can I? I yeah, I go for it. it. Yeah, yeah, go for Seriously, it. Seriously, this is, all right. There has been a body of law that has been decided over the last few, seven, 10 years, 15 years, that sort of lent the argument that if you take a copyrighted work and make substantial changes to it such that it no longer resembles the original work but has been transformed into some new and newly protectable work, then you are permitted to do so. That is not fair use. Fair use is a defense to infringement. That is a permissible use of a, more, of a, a copyright. However, those of us who represent the rights of uh, of artists and copyright holders have found this series of cases that were decided absolutely abhorrent because our understanding has always been that as a copyright holder, you own the right to your copyright, right? To copy your works, but you also own the right to make derivative works. What is a derivative work? It is a work that is based upon the original copyrighted works. The case that just came down now that was the right decision that said, yeah, not so much. There is no percentage on transformative. <clears throat> it, is sub it is a purely subjective standard that is being applied by the courts. And the Second Circuit finally came down and said, yeah, 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 wait. This is, you know, everything isn't transformative. That if you can identify the photograph in the works and, it's, and all you did was layer some color over it, that ain't transformative. That's taking the original works and using it improperly. And so... My best advice is exactly what Dawn said. You got to clear everything. If there's art in any way, don't rely on, oh, we're making a transformative work, especially a film, because your film is not, I trust me, transformative of any works that you're including in it. It's just not. If there's a film, you know, it's a poster in the background, that isn't a clear, that isn't cleared. That you have to get clearance for that if it's if you can see it and it's identifiable. And so you have to know these things. So don't get swept into this while well, I'm creating a work of tr a transformative work. There is, there are no, there are so many lawyers that don't understand this. Don't jump ahead to try to figure that out. Just try to stay within the parameters of what is being directed by the, the producers of the work. As Dawn said, the, they will set the parameters for what is, what their risk tolerance will be. Go, go by that. Okay, awesome. So, um, Jess, uh, have you been getting any questions in from our live panelists here, or, or any of the panelists want to unmute themselves and ask the question themselves? But Jess, have you got any questions in? Uh, you answered the one I got in. <laughs> oh, okay, very good. So, does anyone out there have any specific questions or is, uh, or any comments from the panel? Beth, Beth, Beth I see okay. your hand up. Yeah, I just I just want to add, and this is me with my my assistant set decorator hat, uh, assistant set decorator hat on, and not my my necessarily. Although my agency represents one um, conservation artist who's like one of my advisors, you know what I mean. So I, I I have a tiny little knowledge of the art representation and everything else. But you know there are, you know there's and there's the there's a number of these like cleared art websites that you can access that cater to the film and television industry. But on top of that, like, like if you're, you know, if you're a show, you're shooting in Atlanta, you're shooting in New York, like this is a wonderful opportunity to engage local artists for your project, local photographers, use their work, local painters, get them to sign the clearance agreement, purchase or rent their artwork. Like, I mean, rather than like trying to t necessarily chase down, you know, something that's like impossible to chase down, just like, you know, give use it as a platform to actually highlight and showcase 
And, and some of these artists, they might even be on your own crew. Like you might have a photographer slash set dresser or like, you know, that kind of thing. Like this is, this is a wonderful opportunity to use a lot, utilize that with the least amount of headache, right? You've got like your clearance form that, you know, I mean, I can, again, a, a, a runaway bride store. Like I can remember going to like this local photo fair. It was like around Christmas time with the set decorator one day after hours that I heard about from one of the photographers we were using. And I literally came, cause this is 1998 with a stack of clearance forms. And we, we just, we bought all these, it was like enough to dress the Richard Gere character's apartment, you know, by just going to this photo fair, buying the works off the artist, getting them just, Hey, do you mind if we use this in a, in a, you know, Julia Roberts movie? Oh, of course not. Like, this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to do that and promote these artists, you know, without, without all the headaches. So like, I mean, it's just agreed. something and I, I wanted to throw out there because no, we're not I talking totally about agree. this. We're more I, talking about trying to chase down some stuff that's like descendants on, you know, it's just like, I mean, you don't always have to do that. Like, you know. And, they're, and yeah, and they're an art for film is a perfect example of that. They're an art cube business member and, you know, and they're, and they actually artists get paid for their work exactly and so, yep. and as a community we should be supporting that but sometimes the perfect thing is the velvet elvis that they found at the thrift store no, i know you I know, know and so like what can you do but you know you can try to go there first because you know mm -hmm. for instance in cleared art you're actually it, particularly with art for film we'll do another one maybe with them sometime we're supporting artists that way and isn't that yeah really, you know like you know what we want um, and what comes up a lot, what I've heard a lot, um, and this is for the entire panel, fabrics. Now, 15 years ago, I realized there have been new laws, uh, but tartans and fabric design was something that people want us to clear. What's the deal now? Do we still have to clear, you know, Scottish family tartans? And what what is it with fabric? Anybody have any ideas? I would say no. Um, Unless it's something, especially a tartan is, is very old anyway, but unless it's something incredibly distinctive, or again, as I mentioned earlier, you're, you're using it to wrap a body with or something <laughs> that you don't want to do, you know, for the most part, no. Like, but Burberry might be a good example of one not to, right? Because they're so distinctive. I, the no, Burberry, I, no, just go ahead. I would, I would say okay to that. Again, unless... I wouldn't want a character wearing a Burberry coat with the part and flapping on the inside and murdering somebody maybe, but yeah, you know, maybe, maybe Stephanie thinks differently. But. I, no, I agree with you. Uh, look, functional items are not protectable. So, and uh, the pat and patterns per se, if they are plaids, plaids are not protectable. I mean, you just can't do it designs that are drawn and 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 look like something completely different may very well be protectable um but i you know i in in line with what don just said i i tell a story about um a script that that came to me for uh with the, the client had the script and they said can you go through this indie clear went through it and they told me that i have to contact m, &M mars because i'm using a milky way in the um scene and my character my the murderer is killing someone with the milky way by shoving it down their throat <laughs> <laughs> that's film biz for you yeah. and, and i said well you know technically you can use a trademark as long as you're not using it in a trademark sense so if you're not selling chocolate with it with the milky way you know logo and and mark then you're really free to use it however M&M Mars may take offense to the fact that their product is being used to kill somebody. So that might, might be one of the situations where you want to reach out just to make sure so you don't end up in a suit, even though they would probably lose. <laughs> it's still it's still costly litigation. You know, you want to avoid it. And that yeah. comes down to the what is your risk aversion? <laughs> yeah. Uh, melts in your mouth, not in your. <laughs> anyway. Um, Okay, artwork purchased from Home Goods or West Elm. So, do we need to clear that? Do we need to clear the artwork that we purchased from a big box store? Yes. Okay, and you go through the artist, not the big box store. You well, start so with the artist. It, it depends. If you can find the artist, you go to the artist. But sometimes I've found 
I think it was Home Goods. Actually, I found a contact, and they were able to uh, they were they were able to, to sign off because they must have uh, you know it must have been a work for hire with the artist, perhaps, and they were able to sign off. But if not, they might be able to give you the artist's name and contact, and you can go that way. But yeah, just because it's that's mass produced doesn't mean it's not copyright protected. Well, you know, my dad sold a painting to Ethan Allen. I have yet to get. A request. So I don't know. I'm kind of I'm waiting for that call to come up. Um, oh, really quick, Stephanie or whoever, um, just a clarification. Can you please make the differentiation between a trademark and a copyright? I know it's 101, but it gets it, it, it's okay. It, it, yeah, it's 101 because people need to know it, right? Right. Copyright applies to works, original works of authorship, art. Think art. Think photo, photography, sculpture, writing, um, filming, all of that are, are artistic creations, okay? Trademark applies to a name, logo, um, slogan, et cetera, which is used to identify the sale of goods and services in commerce, okay? So if you are a business and you are using a trademark or a logo to identify your goods and services in commerce, you own a trademark. Could you have a copyright? You bet. Some of the logo designs are copyrightable because they are significantly unique such that they would qualify for copyright protection. Some are not. A, just a, you know, a, a block letter written word is not gonna be protectable as a copyright. But if some, you know, something flowery or something that has more detail in it would be protectable as a copyright. And so you have owners of copyrights and trademarks, like let's say take Walt Disney, for example, right? That has, they own the copyrights on Mickey Mouse, some of which by the way, have gone into the public domain, but they own the, um, I believe, I think they, they, they may, they don't take, it might be way, way back like Steamboat Willie time period, but they continue to create works and continue to register works. And then they trademark Mickey Mouse and all the other characters, they register them as trademarks because they are then used to, as you know, toys and other things so that the, the look is also registered. So they own both. So you have to be careful when you're licensing um, for use in a film or getting permission for use in a film that you're getting all of the, the rights that are included in that particular thing that you're licensing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. That was more, I thought it would be simpler than that. And it's not. So I'm really glad I asked. I was like, this is really yeah, none of this question. is all that simple. I'm I know. I know. Well, this is why we have you as, <laughs> as you know, um, and we have about three more minutes. And so I do want to address that a lot of art cube members are artists themselves and they're, you know, and so how can they protect themselves? Like if they're asked, Hey, can we borrow your sculpture for a film? What should they be, what kind of questions should they be asking? Should they have their own contract? Should they charge? And how do artists, young artists that don't have lawyer money or uh, protect themselves? Um, I would say, cause I reach out to artists, you know, I've probably done it today 15 times already. Cause I got a long list of asks. And if somebody like me reaches out no one is trying to no one's trying to take advantage of you anything that you get any produ the production packet for every show or movie i've ever been on is basically the same the license agreement is basically the same and what they're asking for you don't really need a lawyer to look at it so much i mean if you can read uh, but what they're asking for is the right to use your work within the within the film or television show. They do not have, we do not have the right to use your work in any other manner. We're not gonna go out and make a calendar with it. We don't, that the contract is, or release does not give us that right. Um, so don't worry about that. You know, you're, you're, you're safe to, you should feel pretty confident about, about signing these forms. If you wanna ask for money, I mean, I, I don't automatically you know, say, hey, we want your thing and we want to pay you money. I mean, that's not my job. My job is to help the art department. But if they come back and say, um, you know, are you going to pay me? I'll say, how, you know, you, and if you're starting out, you know, if you want to say 200 bucks or something like that, I could take that back to the art department. It depends on how, how badly they want it. But um, there's something to be said for just getting your stuff out there. But don't be afraid to ask for it. They'll either say yes or no. Um, 
but you know, I have a lot of musician friends who say, you know, you you can die of exposure, you know, but uh-huh. maybe in maybe in a film world when you could actually reference that, like as used in, it might be good for your career and it might make a new friend and maybe next time you'll, you know, but you know, I do try to pay artists as much as we can, but I think if you're just starting out, a reasonable ask like two hundred dollars isn't too much. Guys, it is one minute until, uh, and I want to take this time to thank our panelists. These are highly skilled that gave their time to us. So wonderful. I actually feel like I know more than I did yesterday. And I hope that you do too. We'll see you on Art Cube and we'll do this again sometime. I appreciate all of your time. Thank you.